Hey everyone. Um, my name is Ryan Lemmer. I was here in 2014 for the first FooConf, and this is my first time back, so it's great to be back. Um, at the time, I did a code jiggle bandy, the first code jiggle bandy with um, Davil Dalal. And incidentally, today is the second one. Um, he's doing one with Morton Kronberg, so be sure to, to catch that. It's going to be great. My talk today is about uh, Haskell and making sense of the type system. It's a talk about my experience of going from um, what I would call uh, core Haskell or Haskell 98 to the kind of Haskell you will find in modern code bases. And there's quite a gap. So I came across Haskell about 10 years ago. Um, someone just showed me a few lines of code and asked me if I knew what language it was. And I got hooked and uh, read a few intro books, gave me a good education in functional programming. It's a great education in functional programming. I really recommend it for that. But then you kind of hit the doldrums. There's a big, vast uh, kind of Sahara desert between the functional programming and core type system uh, of Haskell 98 and the kind of uh, types and use of the language that you will see in, in uh, modern uh, code. And so I haven't used uh, Haskell for any longer than kind of a six month period at a time. So it's like an old friend that I don't get to see often enough. Um, but it's been a long time enough to, to um, look around it a bit. So I was stuck. And in 2015, I wrote this book. It's a little book, somewhere between a little book and a long tutorial layered from Haskell 98 into uh, more uh, modern aspects of the language. I finished it almost to the day two years ago, um, and I only read it, uh, read into it again recently for, for this talk. And it kind of still stands. I'm, I wrote it when I was two years more ignorant than I am now about these things. And uh, I would recommend it if you find yourself in that gap between Haskell 98 and wanted to make sense of type systems you see out in the, or, or, or uses of types that you see out in the wild. Um, I, when I read it now, there were a few things that kind of I had to raise my eyebrows a little bit about and that, that I would have said differently. But I can assure you nothing will scar you for life um, uh, in that sense. So I would still recommend it. Today's talk is really pitched at, you know, Haskell is not a broadly used language. and um, so I've pitched it, I've tried to pitch it on, pitch it on a dual level where, um, where if you don't know Haskell at all, you can hopefully still make some sense of it. In all statically typed languages, you get this fact that types classify terms. So terms are values and types are families of values. You could look at it like that. So this is all pretty obvious um, kinds of types. And this is a type I'm going to just carry around a little bit in this talk. So it's a maybe type. Maybe something means um, it's a way to express nullability or optionality of a, of a term. So maybe char could be just char a or nothing. And that's all good. The Haskell type system is amazing if you haven't seen it before. Um, if you're used to Java or um, uh, other statically typed languages, um, it will blow your mind. Although 10 years later, it will blow your mind less. Those languages have really um, drawn in a lot of um, uh, the great things about Haskell, some of them. But still, in Haskell, types are not first class. So you can say x equals hello, and this is true for any uh, statically, most statically typed languages. You can say x equals hello, but you can't, you can't say x equals to the type string. The compiler doesn't know what you mean. You can do equality on terms, but you can't say if x equals type string. Um, you can pass values to functions, but you can't pass types to functions. You can't return types from functions. 
And so while uh, the functional aspect of Haskell is, is very um, high level in the sense of type, uh, you know, functions are first class, types are not. And so the question then is what classifies types? So I'm going to just dip in and out of some code um, as we go along. There's the maybe type, and I've just rewritten it there as um, maybe A, that's the generic type, um, is either nothing or just something. And so I can ask for the type of just some string. And the interpreter says, it's a maybe string. A string is an alias for a list of char. And, but I can't say what is the, what is the type of maybe. It doesn't make sense. Because types don't have types uh, in, in a literal sense here. But I can say what is the kind of thing. So I can say what is the kind of integer. And it'll just say star. It just means type, any type. It's a type. Kind of string is just a type, star. Um, <laughs> kind of maybe string is a star. So that's, that's quite different to the term level. If I say, what is the kind of maybe? Well, that's a star to a star. So now it's saying, I'm, maybe is a type that takes a type. It's a type constructor. And if I give it a type, then it returns a type. So maybe is not a type technically, it's a type constructor, but maybe string is a type. If I look at uh, type classes in Haskell, type classes in Haskell are like um, interfaces, in, um, similar to interfaces. And so here I've got a type class show that uh, defines the interface for to string, essentially, for any type. And if I ask, what is the kind of show? It says star, any type, show takes any type, and it returns a constraint. So kinds classify types to some extent in a very blunt way. Um, I can, for instance, not say maybe, maybe, because maybe takes one type, but maybe's type is a higher order kind. So the, while the kind system is very blunt, it just has these uh, arity specifications. This is just an arity of a type. So one type, this is a type that takes a type. You can get types that takes multiple types uh, and constraints. So these are the only three types uh, mainly that um, the Haskell type system can, the three kinds that the Haskell type system can distinguish. So we can already start seeing cracks in the uh, facade here. The kind system is untyped. Um, the language gets a bit tricky, so you could also say it's not kind safe. Um, it's only arity safe. It only speaks of how many, um, is it one single type, or is it something that takes a type? Or is it a constraint? So I want to show you an example that I'm going to carry right through this talk. Um, and it's a... Uh, Ah, okay. Uh, this is what happens when you do dry runs of the code before you speak. Um, I warn you against that, Morton. Um, so I just want to show you the list type uh, that you all know. That, that is the algebraic data type form of a list. A list is a empty list or it's a cons of something to another list. And so there is a term of a list. I want to do something a bit more interesting. I want to create a, a sized um, list. So a list that has its size in the type. And so here's a data type vector NA. N is going to, it's a type that describes the, the size of this vector. And at this point, it's not going to help me much if I ask what is the uh, type of this um, term, it will just say it's a vector n string, and so will this one be. So n is still uh, not a very useful thing. 
I want to do something like this. I want to say, well, null is a, is a type of uh, a vector zero. It, it's, a, it's an empty list. But I can't do that because uh, zero is a term. It's not a type. So I need a type. And so the common way to do this is um, something called Pino numbering. It's an idea from the 19th century, actually. It's just a recursive way of describing natural numbers. You start with zero, one is the successor of zero, two is a successor of that, and so on. And so these are two algebraic data types, zero and successor, that we're going to use now in our type vector. So I can say uh, null is vector of type zero and this one is a vector of size one. So we read it like this, successor of zero is one, successor of successor of zero is two. I'll just speak like that from now on. But this, this is still quite um, wild and rough because I can say successor of false. And the compiler is perfectly happy with that. It will show me successor of Boolean. So how do we, how do we get more precision uh, with this uh, type? That's where generalized algebraic data types come, come to the rescue. And really, it's a very simple idea, but it's got uh, profound uh, implications, and it's used very broadly. You literally cannot leave the house without GADTs if you're working in Haskell. Um, so instead of the algebraic data type I showed you earlier, now we have refined uh, types for this. So I can say null is a type of zero. Uh, a vector of size zero. And this is a bit more interesting. Cons takes a type and another type of size n, and it returns a vector of size n plus one, which is quite amazing because now the type can, if I ask what is the type of this, the interpreter can tell me this is a size uh, list of size one, uh, and here's one of size two. So as you're using um, the type constructor cons, the, the, the data type constructor, um, it's building up on the type level. It's keeping track of the size of, of your list. Um, and now I can't do things like, um, what is the type of, earlier I faked the size of uh, the null list. And now I can't do it because it's, the compiler will tell me I wanted, um, uh, a type of this, but I got a type of that. I want a type of zero. It should be zero, but I got a bool. So things are getting a bit more um, kind safe, type safe. Uh, and so now I can do some things with this, uh, with this type. I can do vector. I can write a more refined zip. So I can say, um, if I zip two sizes, two vectors of the same size, I should get one of the same size. And in fact, if I then try to um, zip things of different sizes together, I will get a type error. And it says, I expected this type, uh, vector two char, but I got vector one char. So the type system is now catching a whole lot of things that you would typically have to get at runtime or have preconditions and post conditions for. Similarly, uh, if I want to write the tail of a, uh, a vector, I can now say in the type, well, tail only makes sense for something with a size of uh, at least one. So successor of n is at least one because uh, it's either one or more. Um, and it, in fact, if I try to, and that's what we got the error for earlier, if I try to um, define a clause for the null uh, case of, of vector, I, um, I'll get a type error, and it will say, I couldn't match this. Um, I'm, I'm looking for zero here, but you're giving me, I, I, I don't have, this function doesn't work for vec zero. So that's quite interesting that the type system can start doing stuff for us that um, are just not possible otherwise. Well, possible with uh, uh, actual term level code. So that's all good. We've solved vector a bit, but the successor, I can still botch. I can still shove any type in there, and the compiler will be perfectly happy with that. 
So let's just look at what we've done there. The ADT, the algebraic data type, uh, for that case, this n was free. I could just put any type in here, so it wasn't very type safe. Similarly there, I could just shove any uh, junk in there and the compiler couldn't really help me. With a generalized algebraic data type, I've essentially taken uh, this, this is our vector with the terms null and cons, and I've connected each term now here with the type. Cons is at least one, size one. Null is always size zero. And so I've constrained that n in the vector n by using generalized algebraic data types. But what if I wanted to do something now like um, append? So I append some, a list of size n and m, and the resulting uh, type should then be n plus m. But I can't use plus, uh, regular plus, because regular plus is defined on term level. And so, I, but I want to write conceptually something like this. I want to write uh, add, that's a pretty straightforward Haskell definition of uh, plus uh, in, in that sense. But what would, the, um, what would the signature of that type level function look like? So how you do that in, uh, in Haskell is with something called um, type families. And I'm going to use interchange the, the words type families and type functions, but I will sh uh, show you why they are called type families. So there's our uh, zero and successor. And the way you would write a type family, a type function you can think of it for now, is in this pretty awkward um, <coughs> syntax. Type family add equals, um, and then the, the clauses of what would be term level definitions are now type instances. But other than that, on the right side of this uh, syntax, it looks pretty much like a function. That only came in 2008, actually, when I, when I met Haskell. Um, and 2014, pretty recently when I was here last, um, this closed type family uh, syntax came. We can write a function like this. There are quite uh, good reasons to, to use either for different reasons, but um, I'm going to use this syntax from now on. So now I can ask things like, what is the kind of add? What is the kind of the add function? And it says it's something that takes a type and another type and returns a type. And what is the kind of uh, zero? So now that just takes one type because one type has been uh, essentially bound. So it looks like a bit like currying on a function level. And I can do that. Um, and then I must just show you um, something very trivial, but actually quite interesting, <laughs> if you haven't seen it before, is if I add one plus one, I get, uh, it just says, well, that's a type of star. But there's a nice way to just ask, it, ask the interpreter to actually do the type level computation for me. And so I'm gonna do that, and lo and behold, there we go. 1 plus 1 equals 2. And this is now type-level arithmetic. It's happening on the type level at compile time. Uh, Martin uh, Thompson spoke about efficiency earlier, by the way. And uh, when we talk about type-level computation, we're talking about extreme inefficiency. So I'm going to ignore that for, um, for this case. But it has actually great uh, applications, but not for um, high-performance <laughs> computing. Uh, so let's use this type function now in an append. So there's my old uh, algebraic data, or generalized algebraic data type. And I've got an append function there that uses this type level add function. And it's interesting to note here that, again, the, the function definition is completely oblivious about this happening above it on the type level. You just define append like you normally would. But on the type level, through this generalized algebraic data type constructors, it's carefully, or uh, it can't do it any other way, it's working out what the correct um, 
uh, type is, and it's doing this uh, type level arithmetic in the background in that way. So that's all cool, but if I add, um, I can add junk. I can say add into bool, and uh, let me just show you if I ask it to resolve that. It just says if you add into bool, you get into bool. Um, that's starting to show the, the difference between type families and, and type functions. So just to recap, we had, uh, we could do proper type arithmetic here, but we could do whatever we like with the types. There's no uh, kind safety. Um, and when we added junk types, um, the compiler didn't complain because essentially what's happening is type families are not um, actually functions. They're uh, equality axioms. So if I say add zero of successor is successor, um, it's essentially compiling that to an equality axiom. And it's saying if I see add zero to successor, I can reduce it. I can simplify it to the right-hand side. And so that's why when you add into bool, it just leaves it as that because it has no way of simplifying it. So this type arithmetic, while it looks like function application, is actually just um, this play of um, solving equations in the, on the compiler level. So we, uh, with our generalized algebraic data types, solve this uh, uh, kind safety issue with the n in vector, but we still have this uh, other problem. So with successor, I can still put anything in there. So it would be nice to do this kind of thing. If I could define um, a unifying natural number um, type that uh, unifies zero and successor, and then I can say um, those two are natural numbers of kind nat, and then I can start constraining things more. And so how you do it is actually, uh, when I saw this first, I thought, well, that's pretty crazy. But let me tell you about it. Um, it, it it's a good hack. It's a, it's a, I don't know if it's a hack or a, a, a great technique. But um, what you do is you define a regular type, nat, data nat with terms zero and successor. And then you promote it. You shove it all up a level. You lift the whole thing up a level. So nat becomes a kind. Zero and successor become types. And if you want to distinguish between types and terms, you can always use an apostrophe like this. Um, to make it more uh, clear even what's going on, I can, pr I can promote Boolean. Data bool is just true and false, true or false. And I can promote that to kind bool and types, true and false. So why on earth would I want to do that? Let me show you some applications of that. So type promotion is a, I haven't mentioned these things at all. These are um, language extensions. So language extensions are compiler specific. You won't find them in the language spec at all. Um, and that's part of what makes it a bit bewildering to go from Haskell 98 into um, real world Haskell because language extensions are broadly used and they're um, not defined and documented in the same way as you uh, would find them uh, find the Haskell 98 kind of core. And the only way to really learn about them properly is to read the papers. Uh, or that book I wrote. <laughs> uh, although that just covers a small number of them. Um, so there's our NAT data type. That's a regular data type with terms, zero and successor. And, uh, but now I can actually say, if I ask the type of zero, it will say, well, that's a natural number. But if I ask the kind of the type uh, zero, zero is now the lifted uh, term zero, it will say that's a natural number. And so now my type level um, function is using these promoted types. I don't even actually have to put the apostrophes in. The compiler can completely generally figure out, oh, you mean the type or you mean the term. Um, and now if I try this uh, junk uh, add, um, 
I get a type error. It says I expected kind nat, but all I got was this. Uh, you gave me something else. Um, you can only give me types of kind nat, which are zero, or the type zero, or successor. So now we're getting more type safety, kind safety, sorry. Uh, the bool um, example I was showing you, now I can define a type level thing that says, is this type zero? And is, zero, is the type zero, zero? The answer is type true. So we've got all the regular things we know happening now on a, on a higher level. And now I can have increased kind safety here with vect n and I can be explicit and say, that n I mean to be the natural number kind. So I'm constraining it to the two, two types, zero and successor. That's all great, but there's still limitations because if I wanted to write a length function for this vector, um, I can't do, I just can't do this. I can't say vect na gives n because that's exactly what you would expect. It's just, just take the n out of that type and give it to me as the result. Can't do that because you can't uh, return types for functions, raw types. And, but I can do this, I can say, well, okay, return a natural number. Uh, this is now a type on this uh, context, in this context. And, but this doesn't help me much. I can put a bug in the definition there and say, the length of null is one. And the compiler is totally cool with that because it's not um, connecting these two dots. And that's really what uh, dependently type programming then um, is about is to say I want this type to depend on this type. I want types to inform future uh, types further downstream in a in a type signature. So let's uh, let's soldier on and see what that might look like. So with our um, type promotion now of NAT, I've got kind safety. Vector NA, the N is kind safe, zero and successor, and the N in successor, all good and unified by this uh, type. But we still don't have depend dependent types. So I can't have, uh, you saw the function, I showed you length, but another example is if I take uh, just a normal replicate function that we use quite generally on the term level, give it a number and a term, and it will give you a list of a size of that number of that term. So I can't do this. I can't say, well, give me, uh, something that takes a natural number and returns vect na. So either way, I can't have this, uh, I just can't have this dependency. And the way you hack it, um, and here I'm going to just, um, uh, the, the error is going to get a little bit thin here if you don't know Haskell, but I just want to give you the gist uh, of the idea. You, after we've promoted this type, we actually uh, mirror it again on a lower level. Um, and so we actually write a wrapper type, regular type, to wrap that uh, type of that kind. We have regular terms. The S is for singleton. This is called a singleton pattern. And so we bind regular terms with types. So using generalized algebraic data types again, we're um, binding terms with types. And singletons are, um, at first, look like a terrible hack. And then the more you look at it, it's very ingenious the way it uses the, uh, the type system and so on. But um, it's a hack. So let me show you what that looks like. Um, and this is our last little code excursion. So there's our natural uh, uh, number type, and I'm using data kinds, so everything will be promoted. Uh, everything that can be promoted will be promoted. Um, there's my type function add and uh, my type vector. And here's the singleton type. It connects zero to type zero, successor to type successor. And now I can write my length function like this. I can return a wrapped type with a singleton. 
and uh, I can e it's easy to define. And I can now actually, when I if I do, if I want to define the length of null is one, I'll get a type error. And because the the type system is now connecting the dots, I'm, I've given it a way to 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 let one type depend on another one. Um, our replicate function, um, similarly, I can now take a wrapped uh, natural number and return a vector of that size, and we, we've got uh, dependent typing. And something to note here is on the left-hand side, while I'm pattern matching on terms, those terms, because of the singleton, uh, map uh, isomorphically to the types. And so when I pattern match on the term level, I'm actually pattern matching on type level. So this is dependent pattern matching. Fake, but it is. Uh, so, and it's, uh, I just want to show you this uh, type signature here. If I ask what is the type of uh, the partially applied function there of replicate as zero, it will say it's going to take whatever type, but whatever you return is going to be of size zero. Um, singletons, I've now just written one by hand, but there is a singletons library. And this uses um, template Haskell, metaprogramming uh, in Haskell. Uh, it uses a template splice there. And now I can just define, um, it's, so it's, you can think of it as like a macro. And in that macro, I'm just defining regular term level stuff, just defining the natural number that you saw earlier, and a regular add function. And this will actually uh, promote, be promoted. There'll be an add function on term level. There'll be a singleton version of it with the wrapped uh, kinds. And there will be a kind, uh, a type level function add. So it will generate all of that and it'll generate the singletons and, and so on. And there's our length function now and the subtle difference there is, is that um, we use singleton there instead of snat. Um, but singleton library does a whole lot of other things for you um, and it starts making more interesting things possible. So I can actually, if you think about the length of vector, why should I even define that? Because it's in the type. So if I give you a list, that's the whole point of the size vector. If I give you a size vector, I shouldn't even have to uh, implement this. Uh, the type system should implement it for me. Because now this definition, I'm just walking the vector and doing it the hard way. So how you would do it, and here I just want to show you really some crazy. Um, don't take it in. My real point is look at how messy and syntactically noisy this is. But I can actually uh, define in the, in the way, uh, I can ask the compiler to just grab the number out of the type. And this is the syntax for that. And But now I'm still working with singleton types, wrapped natural numbers, and so I can uh, simplify it some more with uh, some fancy footwork in the singleton library. I just want to show you how messy it gets with that slide, and that's the end of our code. So faking it gets pretty messy, and uh, we would, it would be nice if you could, you could easily imagine something more like this, where if I just cleanly ask the compiler, just grab that n out of there and return it. Um, so Haskell is absolutely heading in that direction. Um, in fact, there are uh, experimental uh, extensions now that go well towards this. It's still um, a razor's edge at this point. In 2015, um, a guy, Richard Eisenberg, under the supervision of Stephanie Beirich, who is a big Haskell player, um, I wrote a thesis that actually um, shows exactly how to make Haskell more dependently typed. Um, there's a lot of um, work to be done, and um, it's already somewhat later than I expected after I, I, I read that. Um, so it's expected that in Haskell 9, um, things will get more like that, and we will really be freed from um, uh, hacking with singletons. <coughs> but why would we bother with this, all this uh, um, type level programming? There's a lot of practical um, implications. So append you saw, but also look at something index, something we've all written a million times. 
it would be nice to constrain the type of the number you get in so that you don't get out of bounds errors, so that the type system can actually, well, you will get out of bound errors uh, if it's out of bound, but the type system will prevent it. You don't have to put preconditions in your code. Uh, transposing matrices, it would be nice to say MN goes to NM. Um, and if I take something from a list, uh, it would be nice to be more precise about um, what the sizes of those uh, vectors are. Another thing that I haven't gone into at all here is um, printf. Print, the, the print function is famously difficult in, in uh, a type language like Haskell because the string informs the types and even the arity of the function. And so that's, you can't do that at all with regular Haskell. Um, so that becomes possible with dependency type programming. Also, you, this is a, a very pervasive thing of where we have to write multiple versions of functions for multiple arity. That kind of thing can get nicely unified with um, dependency type programming. So, uh, Idris, if you've ever seen Idris, you might have thought, why are you going to all this crazy trouble? Because that's all you have to do in Idris. All of the, everything I, all the jazz I spoke about uh, is a non-event in Idris. I can just write type, types and terms, type, term level function. I can do that. I can do that. The types and terms are all uh, unified in Idris. Idris is a, is a Haskell-like uh, language, and in fact, how you install Idris is as a package into um, Haskell. So Idris is kind of like this uh, beautiful, shining, polished gem of where Haskell uh, is heading, um, although um, Haskell will never quite reach it. There are other uh, dependently typed um, programming languages, fully dependently typed. Um, Coke is the oldest one, 1984, very old, precedes Haskell um, by a good few, well, a few years. And um, Coke, by the way, uh, in 2013 it won the ACM Software System Award, almost 30 years after uh, it was born. Other uh, winners of that award are TCP Protocol, Unix, tech typesetting system, World Wide Web protocol. So it's in good company, and I find it very interesting that 30 years later, um, this is, it seems that the time has come for this in a different way. It's been around, and it's been used in academia for a long time, but it's, it, 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 there's a crossover feeling in the air. You can really feel it's, uh, it's, it's beginning to happen now. Uh, Idris, Coke and Agda are total languages, what you call total languages, and I'll explain to you now. Idris is uh, partially total, but basically um, what you get is um, you move from regular programming into what we would call a proof system. So totality is worth uh, mentioning. The moment we have type level functions, uh, we have compile time computation. And the moment you're computing, you have the halting problem. You might have things that recurse and don't don't get uh, don't get solved. Uh, you know, it doesn't terminate, and so you move the Turing halting problem to compile time from runtime with dependently type programming. And so this issue of termination is a very big thing. So how uh, Coke and Agda and uh, deal with that is they uh, their type systems are such that they enforce totality. So totality means the, comp the type systems are so sophisticated that the compiler can, s can enforce that you cannot write recursive functions that will not terminate. And how does that work? Well, you can actually, what it does is it tries to always prove that if you do have recursion, it converges, every step converges, and so that it will converge. Um, obviously, that limits um, the generality of, of the language, so that's why we don't use Coke and Agda for everyday programming. Idris is uh, somewhere in the middle. Idris uh, can prove totality for a large class of um, functions. Very amazing. I, I never knew that that was even possible before I came across uh, these, these languages. Um, and the other issue that's really worth uh, uh, looking at here is this 
the Curry, if you've heard of the Curry Howard correspondence, it's this idea that uh, type level, term level is isomorphic. Everything you can define in a lambda calculus, you can define uh, on, on a type level and vice versa. Um, Haskell Curry um, actually in, uh, discovered um, the Curry Howard correspondence the first, he was the first, well, him and, him and Howard, but he actually, over a period of 30 years, uh, saw this in different uh, aspects. So it's, so it's, it's one, uh, it's actually Curry Howard correspondence com uh, kind of refers to this family of um, isomorphisms between term and type. And another way of looking at it is that whenever you write a program with a type, uh, it's the program is the proof of its type. The type is the theorem, the program is its proof. If it, if it can, uh, uh, if it proves the type. Um, with dependently typed programming, um, it's worth uh, no, uh, thinking about, uh, well, how does this relate to testing? Testing shows the presence of errors, proofs show the absence of errors. So that sounds great, and you would think, wow, we don't need to test. But in practice, um, it's going to be somewhere in the middle. Um, there are, but I think there are large classes of things that we shouldn't be testing, that we should be proving in, with type systems. By the way, uh, Morton and I were talking earlier, and he was saying, you know, the only thing types are good for is to prevent you from getting anything done. And um, I, I know why he says that. Uh, I'm not a type junkie, uh, but I have a lot of, uh, I kind of fell in love with Haskell types. I fell out of love with Java and C sharp types horribly fell out of love with that, saw a Haskell type system and thought, wow, this is a type system I could live with. And then kind of reached uh, its limitations and then I kind of got sobered up about that. And I must say now with dependently type programming, I'm getting a bit drunk again. And I'm thinking, wow, this is actually, maybe now is the time for types, finally. <laughs> so um, if you have a, uh, criticisms about types as, as I think anyone has who, who has worked with it also, um, it's worth looking at uh, dependently type programming. It's a new paradigm that actually shifts the whole ball, it's a whole new ball game again and all your old uh, criticisms, you need to kind of update them and, and uh, to keep your arguments fresh, okay. So um, just a, a historical sweep of that. Um, Haskell 98 actually was finalized, I think, in, well, in 2000, but um, the documented in 98. GADT's 2003, type families, um, 2008. Um, type promotion, very recent, 2012. Singleton's also 2012. Type promotions went through a few iterations. Last big type promotion iteration when I was here last very recent. This dependently typed uh, thesis written in end of 2015, I think it was published. So here we are. Um, I'm being kind of uh, conservative here. Maybe uh, Haskell gets more dependent uh, before then. Haskell will never have totality like uh, um, Idris does. But, and then you might wonder, well, why would you not just switch to Idris? And uh, Haskell is just a huge ecosystem, it's, it's, uh, it's a working language. Idris is, is uh, at this point much more limited um, in its scope. But I would say for the same reason as you, would, you should look at Haskell for the mo most concise expression of functional programming. I think Idris has the most concise expression of dependently type programming. If you want to learn dependently type programming in uh, Haskell, you will um, work much harder than just uh, taking Idris in. Although, unfortunately, I think you cannot learn Idris without knowing Haskell a bit because it's the same syntax. Um, and then I wonder um, if, let's say, another 10 years or so, if uh, static typing and dependent typing aren't going to become synonymous because dependent typing, even partial, is so much more powerful. If you feel it, if you f experience it, you will um, have the same experience as you do when you feel first class functions for the first time. It's that same feeling I get. It's, it's, it's like a tectonic shift. Uh, and 
so, you know, the more I learn, uh, the more I think this is, this is what I feel about software. I think we're just beginning. I mean, APL, Erlang here, these are different universes, different laws of physics, um, and we're just about to begin. So, that's my story. Thank you. Any questions? Complaints. Oh, oh yeah. yes. Um, I just want to say one thing I just want to point out. There was a here and previous to the nine coined by Robert Milner with LTS. So yeah. well before all that time. Okay. The other th my question is um so you, you made the uh, comment that interest in, in you know the encapsulation of complex size programming. So I wonder so I, I've done mostly Azure. Um, okay. So Yeah. In yeah. So um, I don't know Agda well enough, but I'll, I'll tell you this: um, if you read, uh, which, I'm, which I think we spoke about it the other day, it sounded like you you have gone into Idris somewhat. Idris has taken in Agda, so he's read that last big uh, um, write of Agda was 2007, and so it's about then five plus years later that Edwin Brady took in all of that, and so. My sense of it is, is that it's a, it's a modernization, but it's partial. So, um, as you say, you can fake partiality in Agda also. So, I, um, I think also what, uh, so there's that. It's more modern. It's, it's newer, which okay. by no means means yeah. <laughs> it's better or anything. But, um, so would you say it sort of learned from the mistakes of Agda? I think it would have learned from some of those mistakes, and I think it would, it, it's because partiality is built in because you don't have to bend backwards to get partiality. I think partiality of, uh, instead of totality is very important in practical programming because I think foolproof systems have their uses, but they're not going to be, uh, they're not generally useful for most of the things we do. Um, so I think that, that to make partiality first class is maybe a, a big um, new kind of thing. Or not a new thing, but a, a better twist on it perhaps for, for um, the kinds of things we would want to do with it. And the other thing I, I always find interesting about languages is there's, there's more to it than the syntax and the language itself because there's this, um, languages come with their ideas and their, uh, so closure comes with, uh, it didn't invent immutability, but it expresses it very nicely. And I think um, Idris expresses type-driven development very nicely. It's a very strong statement of that. And so I, I factored that into, uh, into whether you should go with this one or that one also. Or, or that, that's, my, uh, that's what drives my uh, decisions. Cool. Anything else? I hope I didn't put you entirely off um, dependently typed, but uh, check it out uh, when you want to learn types. Cool. Thank you. <laughs>